We're very excited today to be uh, joined by Jamie Cassip. Uh, Jamie served as the chief education evangelist at Google for more than 14 years and was the second member of the Google for Education team. Uh, in that time, Jamie launched Google G, uh, excuse me, Google's G Suite tool uh, in higher education and K-12. He also launched Chromebook uh, into education and was the creator of the Google for Education Transformation Framework, uh, a holistic approach to education uh, transformation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know that was a very abridged intro. A lot of times I like to start these off by just kind of giving you a chance to talk to us about, you know, who you are and what you've been up to. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much for having me. So you, all, all that stuff is right, right? So I, I was uh, Chief Education Evangelist at Google for 14 years. Uh, you know, we kind of launched technology and education by accident. I was meeting with the CIO at Arizona State University, asking him what his biggest problem was. And at the time in 2006, it was email. And we had just launched a product called Google for Your Domain, which was take your stuff and put it on top of Gmail and, and said, hey, we got this product. And like, next thing you know, we're launching Google Apps for Education into the university space. And I fell in love. And I actually, one of those weird things that never happens at Google, which is I went from the engineering team, I was in the engineering side of the house to the enterprise side of the house, right? So, which is, I don't know if it's ever been done or since done in history, right? Which is this idea is Google's an engineering company. But I wanted to be on the enterprise side because I wanted to be out there working with customers and clients and people and educators about what we could do with these tools. So officially left the engineering team, went to the enterprise side, and two of us launched Google Apps for Education. Then I had a crazy idea of launching it into K-12 because I saw so much technology starting to be used. The iPad had just come out, schools were buying them. And then a couple of years later, I had a really crazy idea and I pitched the idea to Sundar and the team around launching Chromebooks into education. Chromebook was a thing, but it was supposed to be for consumers and, and it was supposed to be for the business side. And, and I kind of pitched the idea of launching in education. Uh, and, and so I did that for a couple of years. And, you know, my job at Google has always been to work across all the different teams that are doing things in education and then kind of think about what's next. Uh, I was there for 14 and a half years through a bunch of different things, and mostly because 14 and a half years later, none of the people that I grew up with there were still there. Google had turned into a big company. Uh, they were bringing in lots of outdoor pe out outside people coming in. Larry and Sergey left, and it was just time for me to go find something else to do. So I'm still doing what I was doing at Google, except now I'm doing it on my own, and I'm working with organizations, startups. I'm working with tech companies and working. I just had a call today with a publishing company to get them to focus on and think about how we do diversity, inclusion, and equity in education, both in higher ed and in K-12. So I'm working with a number of universities. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm having fun. Well, and this is, this is something that wasn't just your like J-O-B at Google, right? This is your passion. This is your drive. This is what you live for. And, yeah. you know, I heard you talk at one point at length, which we probably won't get into too far to end this call, but the charter school that you helped start in, in Phoenix. And you know, that's that near and dear to me on my heart. I'm a product of one of those kinds of schools. I sit on the school board of one of those kinds of schools. And, um, you know, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that school. Yeah. So here's a, here's a, su a surprising fact. It's actually not a charter school. It's a regular high school inside the public, inside the, the Phoenix Union School District. We wanted to create a charter environment inside the system, right? Like, at the end of the day, if we're not changing the system, you know, we're not changing 97% of it, right? There's only so many charter schools you can build. My kid goes, mm -hmm. my five-year-old goes to a Montessori charter school. Yesterday was her first day. So I get the value and I've, I've advised charter schools, but we wanted to build this inside. So the idea was to pitch an inquiry-based school focused on computer science inside the regular high school system. And so this is the Phoenix Coding Academy where we do things a little different, where, you know, the same kinds of rules that you might find in a charter school where there's no homework, uh, there's no note that we're trying to get rid of, you know, we got rid of grades or we converted work into grades at the end of the year as opposed to giving grades out throughout the whole year. We 
are trying to get rid of grade levels. Like we're trying to do it so that student joins the, the, the school in ninth grade and then let's figure out what team they belong on, right? And, and they're, we're opening it up for people like well, me to go in and teach. Uh, and that's I kind thought, of that argument about proficiency, right? Yeah, like proficiency right, exactly. versus the, the factory model. I think yeah. that kind of actually leads us really well into the, the first question I had for you, yeah. which is that there's a lot of discussion about our education system and it isn't working or it's broken. Uh, you know, topics like are our kids even prepared for the jobs for today, much less the jobs for tomorrow? You know, how should we be assessing our current education system? You know, is it broken? Yeah, that's a great question because I often, uh, the first thing I talk about when I talk to educators is about this idea that I, I'm one of those weird education reformers who don't, who who doesn't talk about school being broken, about education being broken? Because it worked for me, it worked for you, it worked for millions of people. Did it work for everyone? No. But when we say it's broken, what we're ignoring is that the world has changed. What I mean by that is that the education system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's doing it really well, right? It was designed to work in a factory model kind of way for a world that required that, where only 30% of people should have an advanced degree because those are the people who are going to manage everyone else. Like it, it worked. Per, we built a superpower of a nation on that education system. So to me, it's not that education is broken. That's the, the wrong way to look at it. What, what I say is that the world has dramatically changed. And now we have a new economy. We have a new future. And what we need to do in education is exactly what our forefathers did 150 years ago and ask ourselves, what's the right model that we need for this future? What's the right model for the future? And if we ask that question, it's more of a calling. It's more of a, yeah, no, I need to step up and, and change it because the world has dramatically changed. And, and so it's a little bit different than walking into a room full of educators and saying everything that you do sucks and is broken, right? Like it's just, it's just not the right way to go into it. Well, nobody it's, wants to hear that either, right? Nobody <laughs> wants to hear that. And it's not true. And so it's what we need to do is change the mindset of what it is to be educated in, in this 21st century. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I'm, you know, my company and everything I do is such a, a product focus of stuff that I also find myself thinking a lot about, like, the kids themselves and how they're different. Like, you know, and so that kind of goes into my, my next question is, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about digital natives and how to think about digital natives. Yeah. Um, you know, how should we be thinking about how to educate digital natives? What does a system really look like for them? Yeah. Well, let's start by stop calling them digital natives, right? So here's what I mean by that. I often <laughs> say that we've lied to this generation. We, we've given them a pass. We tell them they're digital natives. We call them digital citizens. We say, you are just born with technology. and You just naturally know how to use it. And it's just not true. Right. They're terrible at it. They're, they don't know how to use these tools. We've, we're the worst. It's our fault. We lie to them. And, and all the study, study after study shows you, right? There's a Stanford study. 80% of elementary school kids can't tell you the difference between a sponsored website and a real news site. 80% of high school kids from a study last year couldn't pull out the fake story out of four stories, right? Like, like we have told them that they know how to use these tools, and the truth is they haven't learned how to use it. So let's, I think what we need to do in education is take a step back and ask ourselves, have, have, have we taught our kids how to use these tools? Have we actually created digital leaders? Uh, who can take advantage of this functionality and all the things that are available to them to really take on the world. And I think if we start there, that's going to help them prepare for the future, right? Moving away from a scrolling generation, you know, like if you, if you think digital nativeness is scrolling, then yeah, you're right. They're, they're masters at it, right? Like my, my 19 year old can scroll to TikTok better than anybody. Right. So, so it's more about the creation side. Now, that being said, I also believe that this generation is the most creative, the most storytelling focused, uh, the most um, you know, problem focused, right? Like I grew up, I'm old, right? So I grew up with be young and free, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? And this generation is growing up with the world's dying. Good luck, right? <laughs> so they tend to be more focused. And if we taught them how to use these, these tools, 
You have to think about how much information is coming at them at any given moment. And, and, and what we need to do is help them take all that information that's coming at them and help them make sense of that information and convert that information into original thought and intelligence that they can use. Well, and, you know, and sometimes, I mean, it seems like education that, that you and I went through, so much was built around this regurgitation of stuff that they told us, right? Yeah. And now we all have supercomputers in our pockets yeah. and can literally just pull that up in a, in a second. And right. so it, it almost seems like just the philosophy around what they should be doing and or thinking about has yeah. a misalignment, right? Right, so right. I don't They'll... know. Yeah, go ahead. I, the world has changed, right? So I often say that in 1995, 1% of the world was online, right? And today, I don't know, I haven't looked at it in a couple of months from the pandemic, but the last time I looked, it was only 50% of the world was online. So we're still at the beginning of this, right? 50% of the world being online. So there's half the world isn't even online yet. And so we're at the very beginning of this, but that's when the world started shifting and changing and it became obvious that that's where we're headed. So I often talk about that we are now in a digitalized economy and digitalization means everything, right? Computer science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, automation, robotics, AR, VR, the whole package, all that stuff that involves programming and involves computer science and involves technology, those things, that's the future. And that we are at the very, 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 very beginning of that, right? And I use, mm -hmm. when I talk to educators, I use the Google example of the breakthrough that they had with quantum computing. And, and this idea that the breakthrough is that, that you take a, one of those super equations, right? Those crazy long equations and you feed it to the world's most powerful supercomputer. It would take that supercomputer 10,000 years to process that equation. And the Google breakthrough in quantum computing is that they were able to do it in 300 seconds. 10,000 years versus 300 seconds, right? Like yeah. that's insane. Like what, what's in between those two numbers? And yep. so we're at the very beginning of this, but we are now in a digitalized economy. And so when I tell, what I tell educators is that it's a very simple test. If you're teaching students things that machines can do better, we're failing them. That what we need to do is focus on the human skills, right? Problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, the ability to learn, creativity, those things. We used to call them 21st century skills. I stopped calling them 21st century skills because one, we're 20 years into the 21st century. And two, it makes us feel like that's in the future, right? Those are skills for the future. There's, right now, my five-year-old needs those skills right now. And so how do we focus on those human skills? And so that the human skills and the digitalization skills work together, just like you and I are doing right now. We're having a human conversation in collaboration with technology. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we need to get to in education. Well, and you, you touched on one that I think about quite a bit, um, which is collaboration. You know, I, if you think about, you know, what the, what the skill is that's needed and the practice there that's needed, you know, it's, it's kind of funny to me that in our, in our current education system, you know, you take a test, it's a, it's a very solo journey, right? Yeah. It's something you do on your own, right? And how, where's the collaboration built into that? Now that there are some team-based projects, of course, right? You know, even in college, right. I felt like I, I got tortured having to do a lot of those, but uh, right. um, we still largely still have this like individualized path that we go through. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about what what does collaboration look like? What's an ideal model for sure. how you structure collaboration? Yeah, you know, it's I talk about collaboration all the time because what I say is, and I remember the first time I thought people were going to throw at me, but they agreed, which was we talk about collaboration in education, but we don't mean it because education is a single player sport. The problem is that we live in a team based world, and and so I have educators imagine a world, imagine a world where you give out a test, a test that you know. They're not going to remember anything from that test three months from now anyway. But you're giving out one of those tests. And at the end of the test, two kids come up from the back of the class and they say, we were sitting back there and I was looking at her paper and I realized that there were some answers that I clearly knew. And I was looking at her paper and there were some answers that she knew. So we decided to work on this together. Here you go. What would be the result? What would be the... That's, that's right. cheating. Right. <laughs> Why are we teaching our kids that finding people who are smarter than us is cheating when that's all I do for a living? 
is finding people who are smarter than you, right? And so it paints a picture of like, yeah, that makes sense. And when I, and you mentioned college. And so I'm like, I'm talking about real collaboration, not group work. And I bet you, you're talking about group work. Mm -hmm. Group work is when you assign one paper to four people, one of them writes it, and the other three pay that guy or that girl. That was me, mm -hmm. right? I, I wrote the paper, just pay me. I didn't want to deal with other people. I just sat on a typewriter the night before and typed it all out fresh. And, and so that's group work. That's not coll collaboration is like a basketball team, right? Collaboration is having different players together that have different skill sets and different strengths working together. That's collaboration, right? The, one of the things that we look for, at, we used, when I worked at Google, I'm still saying we, it's been a long time. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, that Google looks for uh, is called leadership, right? One of the categories we, that Google interviews for is leadership. And do you think by leadership, they mean, can you tell people what to do and they just follow you out of fear? No, they're really asking, can you collaborate? Can you, can you influence? Can you motivate? Can you get a team going? Can you step back and let someone else lead? Real collaboration, the ability to listen, to ask questions, the ability to change your mind, the ability to look at data and, and make a determination, the ability to build consensus, right? Like that's real collaboration. And it starts with understanding who's on the team. And in the school, in the Phoenix Coding Academy, one of the things that we did is we assess the students when they come in, not for skills, but for where they fit on a team dynamic so that we're not putting four big picture people together and nobody's going to get anything done, right? That we're putting the right kinds of teams right together, together, just yep. like in sports, to work on a project together. Well, and so much about leadership is, you know, is not about this top-down function. It's about elevating others to do the best work that they can. And that's a very hard skill to learn when you're playing a single-player sport, right? When it's yeah. all about you and your own success and can you get the grade and can you, 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 right. you, right? It's almost impossible to then create a leader who has to start thinking we, 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 we. And, right? and there's a way of doing both, right? Like, I, you know, if you had a regular job, you get a performance review. The performance review is based on how you did with others. You as an individual get graded for it, but it's still based on what you did with others. So there's a way to do both. Oh, yeah. Especially, especially that's true in technology firms where, you know, so little is produced in a vacuum. I mean, right. almost nothing, really. Right. Um, and so that's especially true there. Um, you know, and something that I've kind of been thinking about as we, as we talk about this, what, so, you know, we can imagine an ideal scenario where our collaboration is great. We're creating great leaders. They're getting the digital skills uh, that we're going to stop calling them digital natives because they need to be taught it. <laughs> right. But like, you know, let's, let's just say at a high school level, so they've gone from kindergarten through high school now, like what's the big question moving forward that we need kids to be answering or what skill is it that they need to be leaving high school with? Because I feel like that there's some, shift there too about like what goal are we driving towards sure um yeah no that's great because i i'm on a kick recently to even this whole concept that you find in education today like there's themes that develop in education like 21st century skills and then they stick around forever and one of the ones that you find in education right now is uh college and career ready mm -hmm. and i'm trying to get rid of that phrase because what does that mean and why are we shooting so low like what we should be doing in education is helping generate scientists and leaders and policymakers and change agents and inventors and entrepreneurs and, and all this other stuff like that. And if they, and if they can't do that, then they should get a job, right? Like, like that's the job should be the backup plan. Right. And so we got to level up the expectation that we have from students overall. But one of the things that I, I get quoted on all the time is this idea that one thing that we can do right now is stop asking kids what they want to be when they grow up. Stop asking students what they want to be when they grow up because that question doesn't make sense anymore. That question was for the old world, the old economy, where jobs were stable, things didn't change that much. Um, that's not true today, right? I got four friends that are working in industries and on jobs that you don't even know about, right? Like, like we have like jobs are shifting and changing constantly. So the question that I ask students instead is what problem do you want to solve? 
right? What's the problem? I just mentioned that this is a problem solving generation. What's the problem that you want to solve? That's question number one. There's three questions and they're all as important as the next. What, what problem do you want to solve? Number two, how do you want to solve it? And that's an important question. How do you want to take your talents, your gifts, your experiences and solve that problem? Because if someone, if a student goes up to an adult and says, I want to solve climate change, that adult might say, oh, climate change. Let me compute that. Oh, you need to go study STEM. You need to be a scientist. You need to be a researcher. You need a degree in global sustainable development. And in reality, what if they are an amazing storyteller or an amazing photographer? And the way they can solve climate change is by going out and documenting climate change and telling stories about climate change. What if they're an amazing amazing educator and the way they can solve climate change is by going out and creating educational programs around climate change or a curriculum or write a book or there's a million ways to solve a problem. How do you want to solve it with your gifts and your talents? And that takes self-awareness. That takes some self-assessment to understand what, what it is that makes you you. And then the third question is, what do you need to know to solve that problem? What are the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities you need to have to solve that problem? And how do you start building those knowledge, skills, and abilities? And what's important about that is, when I graduated, I could never have prepared to work at Google for 14 years. I, when I graduated high school, when I graduated college, when I graduated graduate school, Google didn't exist, right? And so there's no way for me to prepare for a company or a place that didn't exist. And so what I think we should focus on, like you mentioned, are skills, right? And, and if you think about the problem you want to solve and you think about how you want to solve it, and then you think about what you need to know, let's say they are a photographer and the, and the first job that pops up after they go through all this is a job taking pictures of used cars in a car lot. <laughs> That's the first job that pops up. Most people might think, well, that job's not relevant. That job's not in line with you know, the person wanting to study uh, climate change or wanting to get into solving climate change, but the skill certainly does, right? Learning how to take pictures, learning how to work in a business world, learning what angles look like, learning how to sell an idea, all those skills that you're developing in a job like that completely apply to being a photographer, taking pictures of climate change in the future, right? So that's how we need to focus on it. Well, and I, I love that because part of the reason this has been in my th- my my thinking for a little while is there's a school here that's um, it's a free to attend pub uh, private school um, mm-hmm. partially funded by Micron and Albertsons and a handful of the other companies that are here in Boise called One Stone. And it started as an after school program, and then it turned into a high school, and they do a lot of really great stuff from like reverse pitches with industry you know, like really getting people involved in that level. But one of the coolest things about them is the biggest metric for if a kid can graduate beyond grades and the kind of the normal stuff is if they have taken the time to answer their why statement. And I was like, of course, of course, that makes so much sense is how can you send them off in the world without some sense of the next most important thing that they want to do and go tackle and solve in the world. That's like, honestly, the seeds of how you make change makers, right? People have to want to solve a problem to go do great things. By the way, it's, it's actually, it's not that complicated. It's actually what makes us humans, right? Like Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Pink wrote the book drive. He's he's, I've become friends with him since that, but he wrote the book drive and That's where the idea came from, right? The same three things motivate all human beings. Purpose, autonomy, mastery. You have to have all three, right? And when you think about the questions, purpose is what problem you want to solve. Autonomy is how do you want to solve it? And mastery is what are the skills you need, right? That's where the idea came from, reading that book, sitting on a beach in Mexico somewhere, right? So that is what motivates all of us. And it doesn't matter. And once you figure that out, once you get into that, then it's not a job anymore. It becomes your passion. It becomes your thing. Like I, one of the videos on my YouTube channel, uh, which has, you know, career advice and ideas and all this other stuff on how to network. But one of the, one of the videos I posted was this idea of don't do what you love or something like that. Right. Because I love to sit on the couch eat Ben and Jerry's and watch Game of Thrones. There's like two jobs for that, right? You and me both. Right. That's just like two jobs. 
I hate some of the work that I have to do in the pat in my passion, right? Like Michael Phelps hates swimming to win the gold medals that he wins, right? Like I hate having to get on an airplane at three o'clock in the morning and fly to Montana and to speak to educators about education and watch the Super Bowl on a 32 inch, you know, 1985 television set in the Best Western. And there's nothing I love about that. But the purpose is what drives me. And so that's the wrong advice. Find, you know, find something you love to do and find a way to make money. No, find a passion, something that burns you, something that you want to spend lots of hours trying to solve. Well, and something that I talk about, like I gave a, a speech at a graduation last year and, and you know, I was, I was talking about this kind of similar idea. And I also said something to integrate into it is, you know, figure out how to help other people, like make people the center of your why statement and the reason why you're moving forward, because you can't, you'll sleep well every single night you go to bed like a baby when you know that your, your drive and your mission, the thing that you're doing with your day advances others around you and helps others around you. And so that's kind of the other thing is like bringing the, the people centric. It's not about making the quickest buck or whatever. It's about how you sure. help other people. Now, right. the truth is, is the results is you li largely will be successful because, you know, that's by helping other people, you are sure. creating. Opportunity, right. right? Um, so anyways, these are, these are great thoughts. I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying this back and forth, but kind of a bring it to a local level here. Yeah. Um, you know, we have this private school here that I think is a, a great model. We have a couple charter schools. Something that's different in Idaho is our charter schools are actually a part of the public school system. Right. Um, so that's that's pretty cool in the sense that they're not usually off on their own. It does happen from time to time. But for Idaho, which ranks 49th out of 50 in per student funding and regular flirts with being dead last, um, you know, what are our low hanging fruit? Um, what are the things as entrepreneurs, as parents, as business leaders, community members that we can advocate for and that we can do to, uh, to try and help these systems and set up our future leaders for success. Yeah. You know, that metric is always an interesting metric. I feel like there's like 10 states that are 49. Like, like I just, I, <laughs> it just always sounds that way. Um, I think the first thing you do is dive into that metric a little bit, right? What does that metric mean? What, it, what, what are we measuring there? And students spending in what? Students spending in textbooks, students spending in buildings, students spending in teacher salaries. Like, what does that mean? Because these things matter on an individual level as well, right? So no matter what resources you have, are you spending those resources in the right way, right? Like, you know, you take a place like New York, that's number one. I think there's like $30,000 a kid what are they spending their money on versus, you know, Boise or Idaho or Arizona, where it's like $7,000 a student or $6,000 a student. Like, is that student in New York getting a better education than the student in Boise? Like, I, I, I don't know. And so what are those metrics? And so for me, the low, low hanging fruit is to sit up, sit and come up with a list of things that you want to measure. I often hear all the time, from people, oh, like you're going to Boise. Oh, you got to go check out this school. You, this is an excellent school. You love it there, and you should go see it. And my response is always, "What? Why is it excellent? What? Why is it such a great school?" And the response is always, "Oh, their test scores are high." Mm -hmm. That's not my metric. Are kids happy there? Do they show up early? Do they stay late? Or do they show up at eight at seven fifty nine and fifty three seconds so that they don't have to be there another minute? I like like that to me is a, a kid showing up at seven or work on a project and staying till six because they're passionate about the project they're working on. That's a metric, right? So how do we measure stuff matters. And so I think the low hanging fruit is to sit and make a decision. What do we want to measure? And how do we measure problem solving skills and collaboration skills and critical thinking skills? And once we figure that part out, then we can talk about, well, how do we fund that? What's the right way to fund that? At what level? So that we're not spending a whole bunch of money on things that we might not need. You know, as I said earlier, like this idea that if we're teaching kids stuff that machines can do better, we're not serving them well. So it doesn't matter how much you spend if you're not spending it on the right stuff. No, that's great advice. I mean, I think that when I hear about statistics of what we are currently measuring, I mean, and this is this isn't just an Idaho thing. This seems like yeah. it's somewhat nationwide, right? I hear like go on rates, 
So how many kids go on to college, which is interesting because sometimes solving problems doesn't require colleges, right? That's a true, true thing. Right. Uh, although college is great. Um, you hear about test scores, of course, standardized test scores, which back to the system being designed for the, <laughs> the factory model, like a standardized test is a lot like a function of the factory, right? Sure. Um, and so that's another kind of interesting one. And then funding, like those are the three things I see we measure. I've never seen a measure of how well our kids are collaborating. Have you? I've never seen that. No. no. And the, the tools are out there. Just because it's hard to do doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. So Look, at the end of the day, this is choice. It's will, right? We, what are we willing to do? What are we willing as a community to do? And, and a basic understanding that this is an investment, right? Like we can get into all the numbers. Like if you, for every, every dollar that you spend in education, you're not spending $4 in a prison system, right? For every $5 you spend in education, you're not spending, you know, $9 in social services, right? Like, like, like there are real numbers out there of looking at education as an investment to our community, especially for this next generation, because this is the problem solving generation. They're the ones who are going to have to solve a lot of our problems. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so what the least we can do after effing up the world so badly for so long is give them the right resources and funding and skills to, ha to help us fix it. Yeah, we can't leave them helpless. Uh, 100%. Well, with that, we're, we're kind of at time. If you have any other final thoughts, we can, uh, we can do it. Otherwise, I appreciate immensely you taking the time to talk with us. And, you know, for me personally, this is such an interesting topic and you have some of the, the best thoughts that I've heard uh, oh, well, out in the world. Thank you very much. So I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk with us and, and lend your knowledge to the Boise Startup Week community. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for having me. I, Boise is one of my favorite cities. I like going up there. I actually talked to the legislator about these things uh, last mm -hmm. year. So hopefully some of that stuck. Um, and, you know, if you want to reach out, communicate, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. My message button is open. Feel free to reach out. And, you know, everyone should go subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, which I can say happily that I have. I was probably in your first hundred subscribers. Oh, you're so. awesome. Uh, nice. We're going to have a party when it, I'm going to have a party with the first thousand when we get to a million. Oh, sweet. I'll, I'll continue to watch my email for, uh, <laughs> for my <laughs> invite. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, looking forward to connecting with you again. And we'll make sure all the resources and links that you just mentioned, we'll make sure we have that and uh, the information. So everyone looking, if you look down here, you'll see all those links. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah.